I'd like to welcome back the uh, Schroeder's Value team uh, in the person of Nick Kirridge this time. Uh, his sidekick, Kevin Murphy, is never, never a million miles away. And uh, previous speakers with us, we always enjoy what they have to say. Uh, welcome back to us, uh, Nick. Thank you very much, David. As David said, I'm Nick Kirridge. I co-head up the, uh, the Global Value Team uh, at Schroeder's with my colleague, Kevin Murphy. And I've entitled my presentation, Successful Failure. I think it's kind of one of these occupational hazards of being a fund manager is we like to stand up on a podium and talk a bit about successes. Often see presentations with lots of charts with share prices that go bottom left to top right and those little green arrows saying, I bought here. Um, and what I want to do is turn that on its head and talk a lot about basically all our failures. Uh, and how they've defined us and what they've done in terms of impacting our portfolios, our performance and our thinking over time. But actually first I want to take a step back. Now, London Valley Investor Conference, you know, biggest conference of the year, always on the scene. Obviously I got paid to say that. And I've been thinking about this for a couple of months, about what I might say, and I had this idea for this great presentation, what I thought was a great presentation. Slightly controversial, a bit different, trying to make people think. And as I kind of put this all together and got very excited about it, I was disturbed to find out that presentation had already been given. And that it had been given by my colleague Kevin last year at this exact conference, which I hadn't attended. So that was, that was slightly embarrassing. But actually, as I went through Kevin's presentation, um, it was almost like a microcosm of all the reasons that nobody wants to be our kind of value investor today. And therefore, I'm going to use it as a benchmark to start and go through. But first, maybe best to define our kind of value. So value is a broad church. And it's interesting to hear the comments of the, the investors today. I think this is changing, certainly in terms of the sentiment in this room, perhaps. The father of value investing, Ben Graham on the left, buy the cheapest, shop, cheapest items in the shop, and then uh, a broadening of that approach over time into something with a similar philosophy, but actually very, very different implementation today. If you look at portfolios, the Warren Buffett, work out what you want to buy and wait till it's on sale. Now, both of these approaches have been fabulously successful over a very long period of time. But I think it's fair to say over the last 10 years, one's been more successful than another. And what we've seen is even within value, popularity waxes and wanes. It's been a lot harder to be a, a Grahamite uh, investor in the last five or 10 years. And I think David alluded a bit to that and, and Andrew touched on it at the beginning as well. Um, within this, we'll, even old hands, value investing old hands, have struggled. We know why this has been the case. Um, when you're looking at the stocks on the right-hand side, you're frequently, you know, the quality value franchises, you're quick, frequently coming up with companies that you, you know, that are familiar, that you understand, and that have had very predictable and stable, well, we talk about cash flows, what we really mean is share price trajectories over the last 10 years. On the left-hand side, you're frequently coming across businesses that not only might you not have come across or you're distrusting of, but have been incredibly volatile. And I don't know about you, but I've experienced a shortening of client investment horizons over the last 10, 15 years. I don't know if it's the internet or the fact that the stock market is the lead item on the news more often these days, whatever it is, but people focus much more on the short term and drawdown is on everyone's mind. Volatility is risk. People are struggling to get that out of their mind no matter how much you say it. And that makes it very, very difficult uh, when you're coming up with some of these businesses which people simply don't know, trading markets they don't want. Uh, now, uh, within this, it, it's customary each year to, at the London Valley Investor Conference, come up with at least one stock idea which you present on. Now, uh, in some ways, the, the big danger of picking stocks on the left here is, is that despite the fact we want to pick the best idea, we of course flirt and fish in a market where we have the potential to make ourselves look immensely stupid. Um, and when I look back over last year, of course, we tried to pick the best idea, the idea that the most attractive, a standard beer bearer for the Graham I investment philosophy, one we thought would make us huge amounts of money. And so we plumbed for this one. <laughs> now, <laughs> for those who saw David's introduction, you'll notice the list of stocks and how they did last year. Um, Lomin did not cover itself in glory, but, but in fact, it's kind of worse than that. These are the stock returns for the FTSE All Share over the last 12 months, over 2015. Um, 
Uh, I've given you the returns, every stock, and how they performed in absolute terms. Quite a number of stocks. Wait, we'll get to Lom in a minute. It's coming. <laughs> hold on, hold on. Ah, uh, there it is. There it is. Eight from the bottom. Now, actually, one of the slightly disturbing things about this, and I, I haven't changed it, I'll just talk about it, is that this isn't even as bad as it was. The returns are confused by a rescue rights issue that happened at the end of the year. The returns, if you want to look at it from the original shares, were down more than 90%. Um, this is a huge occupational hazard of, of the way that we work. And last year, Kevin tried to use a kind of a, a clever graphic to try and espouse the value that was on offer and look back over time. So he gave the example of this car. Um, it's a DB9 from 2007, and it was valued at that time at £130,000, which of the day in 2007 equated to about 6,500 Lonmin shares. And then we did some bells and whistles stuff and highlighted that over the subsequent seven or eight years, 6,500 shares now bought you this. This is a rather wonderful Kia Picanto, which I have to admit I had never ever heard of before, but is available for a very reasonable £9,750 on the road taxed, I'm reliably informed. Now, th this was, you know, a, a semi-amusing and, and supposedly compelling way to talk about it, but I thought it was only fair to wind this on to incorporate the performance <laughs> of the, the last 12 months, you know, on the basis that we know that a stock that goes down 90% falls 80% and halves again, and Lonmin didn't even do that well. Um, th th this, is, this is what we subsequently got. <laughs> Now, he's a happy chap, isn't he? <laughs> but I think it's fair to say we weren't. Um, Lon, Lonmin was a, was, a, was a huge failure, uh, or over that time period, certainly. We talk about time horizons, and we have, in fact, doubled down in the rights issue, and I can talk more about that, perhaps in the Q&A. But um, within this, this is the reality of what we face. There are two sides of every coin, and the stocks that have the potential to make us the greatest amounts of money also have the greatest potential to elevate our career risk and make us look immensely stupid. Why on earth would we pick a stock that had the potential to do that? Why wouldn't we go for a safer one? And, and this is the reason, because frankly, unless we fish in those kind of markets, we're not going to be able to do this. Now, we run a number of products on, on, on our desk, but Kevin and I are responsible for the flagship deep value product, the Schroeder Recovery Fund, which is a wonderful product. It's been around 45 years, and it's one of the deepest value products in the market, certainly the deepest value that Schroeder's runs. And, and I've just put the track record of our 10-year tenure of this product up on the screen. We were actually slightly behind the 45-year track record, which is closer to 3.5% net of fees per annum for 45 years. But over our time period, we can't find another way to generate these kinds of returns. Now, as has been alluded to, it's not been a vintage period for a Grahamite deep value style of investment, but there still has been huge amounts of money to be made from this kind of approach. I suppose looking at this, the first thing that kind of comes to your mind maybe is, well, the long mins, they must be the exception, right? They're just, there can't be that many long mins if the performance over time is, is quite good. And it gave me an idea why don't we have a look back? Why don't we look back at the returns over time and see which were the Lon Min type returns and see how they impacted performance? So, last 10 years, calendar returns each year, the percentage return relative to the index. Now, what you can see is, uh, unfortunately, quite a lot of volatility in there. That's not by design, uh, and it's not necessarily a function uh, of every time period of history either. Our turnover in this fund is 20% has been over 10 years. Every year, somewhere around 20%, five-year holding periods. We're not flipping things around, but the market, of course, is. So perhaps the first place to look is to look at 2015. Let's put Lonmin in context. Uh, I think the first thing to come up with is, rather shockingly, Lonmin was not the worst thing in the portfolio last year. Um, it was that one. These are the five worst performers in absolute terms. There was, in fact, this one, Apollo Education. Now, for those of you, um, you know, who know the UK market well, you'll know that is not a UK stock. We actually went off benchmark, <laughs> and out of the 20,000 global stocks we could have picked, we picked that one. Um, that's slightly disappointing, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> I have to say, there are years where that's been in a top performer category, but it certainly wasn't last year. In the UK market, 
Anglo-American, I think there's a prevailing theme there, and anyone who talks about commodities, you're going to see a large number of these kinds of stocks. Last year was, was hardly vintage. Certainly, we did a good job of you know, excellent stock selection, pick the worst. Uh, and within that, Hargley Services, a smaller company, this is a kind of, in some respects, many value investors do know this. It's kind of coal services in the UK, extremely out of favor. And then Home Retail Group, which, of course, has had a slightly different um, return this year, but last year was absolutely appalling. I suppose when you, you look through that and you think, well, that's not great. I mean, Longmin clearly is not an exception last year, but, but it must be over time, right? I mean, you know, you've outperformed the index net fees by close to 3% per annum over 10 years. There just can't be that many of these kinds of returns back through time. But there are. There are every year. Shocking, shocking returns. Now, um, there are some awful patterns in here. In 40% of all years, we've lost more than 75% in a single stock. In 80% of all years, we've lost more than 40% of returns for investors in a single stock. I take my job very, very seriously. It is a privilege to invest on behalf of clients to do what I do. And these all hurt. They hurt very badly, and they hurt very badly not just because I don't like having made these investments, but also because psychologically I'm set up to have them hurt. We all know that behavioral finance says you feel losses twice as badly as you feel gains. And when I went through the names behind all of these returns, I, of course, remember them all. I remember them all very acutely. But I'm not going to go through them all, but I am going to pick out a few. Because I think the truth is our losses inform our future judgments and our behaviors, perhaps not always in a good way, to make Dave's point. Just because you lose money one time doesn't mean you shouldn't do it again but you should learn a lesson. And with that, I'm going to talk first. The first place to start is the, one where, the ones where we've lost all our investors' money, Black's Leisure. This is a business, hopefully some of you will know, the high street retailer, it's still around. It seemed like a very, very obvious place for us to make money. This stock was in a growing segment. The high street was on its knees back in 910, but actually outdoor wear is one of the few areas that's growing. These were the market leader, 25% of the market. Um, they had a reasonably, significant, uh, reasonably sensible shareholder base. One of their suppliers was heavily invested, a management team that made sense. A long history of making margins between 5 and 7% on 300 million quid's worth of sales. It's trading on a normalized PE of around 2.5. Balance sheet looked OK. It, it wasn't. What happened, of course, is what always happens with retailers is when things got a bit shirty, uh, the trade insurance people get a bit nervous, they start to yank trade credit insurance. We're now in a situation where they need liquidity, a rescue rights issue is mooted, we tried to support it, it failed at the last minute, and we lost all our money. This was a very difficult one, and I think it's quite interesting. You could say the lesson of blacks is never do that again. Uh, we've had three companies go bust on us pretty much uh, over the last 10 years. Uh, and of the three, this is the one I would do again every day, over and over. I think you're right 70 times out of 100. We don't live in a deterministic world in investing. It's probabilistic. You know, it's not like holding out a, an apple and dropping it to the floor, you know, which happens with certainty every time. Sometimes one thing happens, another time another does. It's about probabilities. It's about grinding it out. Wagon automotive strikes fear into my heart. And I know it's you know, strikes fear into the heart of, of several other people here who uh, were investors with me at the time. This is a business that with blacks, you can say with hindsight, perhaps we could be forgiven. There were compelling aspects to that investment. With Wagon, I think we've got less excuse, frankly. It was 2007. There were precious few deep value investments kicking around in a very frothy market, and we were desperate for an idea. And looking back, behaviorally, I think perhaps we pushed hard because you had to look through very, very squinty value glasses to see the joy in a car parts manufacturer in France in 2007, or in any time period, frankly. Single client, Peugeot, um, uh, but actually had a 15-year track record of making reasonable returns. Had a balance sheet that looked OK. The problem, of course, began, as it often begins, with an acquisition. An acquisition that geared up the balance sheet, but it was going to be fine. But then the cash exceptionals begin, and then you start to think about all the off-balance sheet financing. Now, we had given consideration to this, but factor financing, working capital, kills businesses. It leaks out. It eats away, and it accelerates things. It's kind of that old adage, how did you go bust? 
you know, slowly at first, then very quickly. And that's very much what happened with this business. And they were forced into another very large rescue rights issue, a bit like Lonman. At which point we looked critically and hopefully unemotionally at the business, and though it was like a punch in the kidneys, we let it go. It had one of the most impressive deep value investors uh, in the world, in Wilbur Ross on the register, and we said no. We said, you know, the lesson to be learned here is not just because someone else is doing it. Um, the business subsequently went bust. And of course, Wilbur's very clever. He also owned the debt, and he took it private. So <laughs> that's why you don't necessarily just do what you can see. This is a business where we learned a lesson about off-balance sheet financing, about being more critical, and about quality. It's not don't invest in low-quality businesses, but you, know, you have to be very, very careful when you're doing that that you fully understand the mechanics. Avis Europe. Now, this, this holds a special place in my, my heart, a special dark place in my heart. Um, this is one of the first investments that I recommended when it became apparent that I was a value investor. I kind of, I didn't start as a value investor. I know we're all meant to be born as value investors. But I came into the investment market very kind of naive and young, and I just liked investment. And actually, it, it was kind of falling under a semi-mentorship of, of a couple of investors, one of whom may be here today in, in, in Nick Purvis, and, and falling into this value man mantra. And Avis was one of the first ideas I pitched uh, to him, and, and that's why he'll be the one wincing painfully if he's in here somewhere. Um, this looked like a very obvious value stock, a predictably cyclical business with a long history of range-bound markets that was in an industry that was consolidating, that had an oligopolistic tendency to it, that had a reason to be more rational than in the past. Um, and of course, it turned out to be a massive value trap, certainly over much of its life. Um, this is a stock that bit us over and over again. Um, it was an incredibly and painful investment. Uh, now, I can see it's all got a bit sombre and quiet, really. I almost feel like people are starting to feel a bit sorry for me here. So I don't, don't want that to, to keep going. But it, it, I have to say, it was at this point when I was putting this presentation together that Kevin, my colleague, took me to one side and said, you know, do you like your career? <laughs> because because you, you seem to be, you know, where, where, you know, where are you going with this, really? <laughs> Uh, uh, and that's a very, very good point. Uh, and, and the point here is, is that it is impossible, it is impossible to generate great returns without fishing in these kind of markets, but there are great returns to be had. Here are the best five stocks in each of those years. Now, uh, I'm going to start with the biggest returner, the 568%, which was... Avis Europe. Now, there's a lesson here about averaging down, about darkest before dawn, about not completely losing your mind, about not listening to everyone, potentially, uh, about trying to be sanguine. But there are enormous returns to be made. Perhaps the most, one of the most profitable trades we ever made was uh, averaging down in the stock. Some of that enforced through a rights issue. Some of it because we actually just did it. And, and it led to outsized returns over subsequent periods. There are lots of these kinds of investments. Dixon's. This is a great example of how the psychology around a business can go from very wide extremes. When I talk about psychological extremes today, and I give the example of tobaccos, you know, a, a sector which was despised 15 years ago to one that's absolutely beloved today, it's almost too long a time period to understand how that mentality has changed. In Dixon's, it happened in about three years. It went from being a complete basket case, the largest electrical retailer in Europe, a rescue rights issue on the verge of going bust, a terrible company, supposedly, to one in which today it's lauded as one of the higher quality aspects. People see it with the car phone, car phone warehouse merger as being structural growth. And it gave and gave again. It was also in the top five in 2014, and it was in the top 10 in 2013, it, just off the bottom here, 70% it gave you then. The compounding effect of the returns in this business are absolutely enormous. St. Ives. I don't know why I picked St. Ives, really. I just got a kind of little soft spot for it. This is a terrible business. 
Um, you know, it's printing and it's marketing and it's, it's horrible and old school. And we doubled our money, more than doubled our money, very easily in this business by buying it soon after it had disposed of a company and therefore improved its balance sheet. So we, you know, learning lessons, its balance sheet, we weren't taking huge amounts of risk, but we were buying a business on four times, not recovered profits, current profits. It just doesn't take a very different prism through which to look at that business to think that might be worth a bit more. And indeed, that's what subsequently happened. Now, I kind of think about this, and I think this is, you know, the amount of work that went into these stocks is absolutely enormous. The detailed stock work and analysis that goes into these companies is huge. In many cases, it took us years before we got comfortable enough to buy them, and we were still years too early. But it is absolutely imperative. It is the only way to generate long-term returns of this kind of nature is to fish in markets that have the potential to make us look immensely stupid, that will increase our career risk. This kind of deep value Grahamite investing is a compounding engine, and it has not been as out of favor as it is currently, as I've seen at all in the last 15 years of my career. And I think it's certainly something that people should be looking at closely today. Now, I know it's customary at this point to give a stock example, and I am sure, given our appalling track record of picking turkeys at the London Valley Investor Conference, you guys are desperate to hear which one I'm going to go with. Uh, and, you know, to stoke the controversy, because you're in for a penny or you're in for a pound, let's do it. <laughs> let's do it. Okay. So, <laughs> I, was with, I was with some quite uh, risky investors the other day who were invested in our fund and they buy individual stocks too. And we were talking about this and they, and they looked at me and they went, yeah, we, we've bought a bit of Barclays and we've, you know, we've bought a bit of Lloyd's. And I was like, I'm Royal Bank of Scotland. And he goes, don't be stupid. <laughs> this RBS pun thing is going to continue, so I apologize for that. But um, this has really not been a great investment. It's been a terrible business for a very long period of time. Um, I picked this time period because simply if I'd gone back a previous year, the scale means you just, it looks like it, is like a dead person, it goes down to zero and flat lines. <laughs> so, so, you know, I've, I've, I've tried to make it so you can actually see something from this. But the, the point to be made here is that this has been appalling for a very, very extended period of time. And we kind of know the history behind that. We kind of know where that's come from. And, and even today, if you, you know, look at what's in the press and what's in the news, um, you know, this is a punch bag. And it's in many ways a poster child for everything that was wrong about banking and investment over that time period. Um, but, you know, one of the things that I think people are missing here is things have massively changed. And that analogy of the frog in the hot water and it's just boiling and it, but it's slowly, slowly, slowly and it's not noticing, I think that can happen the other way around as well. And I think the amount of change that's gone on in this business over the last eight years is absolutely enormous. And I'm going to pick out a few numbers to highlight that. It doesn't mean everything's better. It just means it's not the same business that was on the BBC News that Robin Peston was talking about seven years ago. So, RBS, post-ABN AMRO, which I think we can all admit was the kind of apogee of ridiculous M&A and crazy behavior, misplaced allocation, um, was an absolute behemoth. It had 2.2 trillion pounds worth of total assets. Um, but in the subsequent period, things have changed absolutely enormously. So loans, it had over 700 billion sterling at that point. Today it has around 300. So it's halved in size in total size of its total loan book. In terms of its risk-weighted assets, they're down nearly 60% over that time period. And of that, investment banking does not exist. I don't know if you noticed this, but Royal Bank of Scotland doesn't have an investment bank, really. It's gone from close to 300 billion, that was half the point about ABN AMRO, to almost nothing today. It's almost pure retail and commercial. Not quite, but getting pretty, pretty close. I'm not sure people have noticed this. Despite reducing assets by more than 50%, regulatory capital over that time period has increased. Now, not massively, but when you halve your assets, halve your risk-weighted assets and keep your capital the same, that's pretty good in terms of your margin of safety. One of the things that's also quite interesting over that time period is 
regulatory capital is more stringent today than it was before. What counts as regulatory capital today, um, uh, frankly, would have been a fraction of what was regulatory capital historically, which is why when you look at the Bank of England stability report, they turn around and say, the UK banking sector has somewhere between eight and ten times the amount of capital that did prior to the downturn. Now, I don't know about you, it seems to me like humans probably have nowhere near enough capital just when we need it and then far too much just when we don't. But this idea is one where the underlying ratios probably understate how much extra capital is on there. Again, that is not the same as no risk. There is risk in all businesses. That is just saying margin of safety has dramatically increased. Now, that's the worst one. The <laughs> Let's try and think about this unemotionally, blank piece of paper. This business is now effectively a UK retail and commercial bank. So let's try and think a bit about UK retail and commercial banking. This is an oligopoly. People talk about franchises and franchise value. This is an oligopoly. There's basically five guys do all the lending in the UK. Do all the mortgages, do all the, the, the corporate lending. It's very tightly sewn up. And competitive intensity is about as low as it's been for a very long period of time. Let's do the porters on banking. So barriers to entry. You want to create a new UK retail banking franchise across the UK. How easy is that? Pretty hard. Government's falling over itself to try and create competition. EU, state rules, carving out Williams and Great Glynn, allowing new competitors in. They're falling over it, and even then, they're struggling to actually do it. The barriers to entry in this industry are absolutely enormous. Competitive intensity has reduced dramatically. You'll notice these days there aren't people offering 100% mortgages. Everyone's offering 20% up front, I need 20% down, 80% loan to value, and it's 2% margin. And nobody competes because they have to make money, because times are tough. Customer power. Everybody hates their bank. Can I have a show of hands for anyone who has moved their bank account in the last 10 years? Okay, so I'm estimating somewhere between 5 and 7%, 10%, maybe. That's called customer loyalty. That's what Unilever spend a billion dollars a year advertising Dove soap to try and get. Now, actually, it's laziness. We're all really lazy, but it, it's irrelevant. The end effect is the same. Customers are very sticky. Substitutes. I've got no idea if I'm going to need oil or gas 50 years from now. Humans are pretty innovative. We might invent a new renewable. I'm pretty sure I'm going to need finance. It's going to be hard to get rid of lending. As I go through this, many of the characteristics of what I would call a pretty good investment start to appear. Um, retail banks. There's a 100-year history of these businesses making more than 10% ROEs. I know we're going through quite a tough time right now, but um, there is a very, very long track record, and I'm not sure things have changed so much that we can say there's an actual reason businesses won't make a return. Aha, uh -huh, Nick. But, you know, what about some of those other d headwinds? Well, I think banking has been de-risking for nearly a decade. I can't think of another sector which has been reducing risk so consistently since the great financial crisis. I can think of a number of stocks and sectors that did it for a couple of years and then went back to the mill, debt's been taken on again, buybacks have started, all the rest of it. But as a function of regulatory headwinds, these guys have been, they've had the boot to their throat over and over, de-risk, de-risk, raise capital, reduce loans, over and over and over. Now, as an investor... I actually quite like that. I wonder whether or not the risk piece is the bit people don't understand. What about some of the other things that are very high profile? Regulatory and litigation. Things sound good in investment, but do history back them up? In terms of regulation, there's nothing more regulated than UK utilities. UK utilities is an aggressively regulated sector where once every five years, government turns around and says, Great job, we'll have those profits start again. That was a sector that went up 500% in the 2000s. So regulatory is not an impediment to share price returns. But what about litigation? You know, banks, PPI, LIBOR, over and over. Mm-hmm. That didn't stop tobaccos going up 1,000% in the 2000s. For everything you throw, I've got an answer, and it's almost always valuation or balance sheet. And here's the killer. RBS trades at close to half its tangible book value. A tangible book value that's been flat now for 
seven years. Now, flat's not great. It's not growing. But let's be clear. If flat was the worst outcome five years from now, if my entire downside is no downside, and my upside is an option on a lot of money, wouldn't you take that investment every day? Wouldn't you make that investment with your money every day? I would. And I would do it with my own money and with my clients' money, which I think of as pretty much one and the same thing. So it's a despised sector, an undervalued company, and a potent combination. Um, just a very quick promo before I hand over for any Q&A, if there's any time, which there probably isn't. But um, if you've liked any of this stuff, please go and have a look at our, our website. It's, we talk a bit about some of these things. I know we're kind of a bit like David. We're, we're, we're at risk of saying things that are a bit crazy at times, a bit contrary, and a bit out there. This is a resource for both for you, but also for any clients that might invest with us. We are understand that clients can check the, the valuation of their portfolio every day, and we can't be out there holding their hand every day. But we can use modern technology to have a slightly better dialogue with people and get them to understand what we're doing. So we write two or three emails a week about what we're doing um, and why we're doing it. Uh, and hopefully that will help people understand some of the volatility and why we're so, such a vowed Grahamite. And with that, I'll hand over to Q&A. Thanks very much, Nick. So, <laughs> round of applause for that. Thank you very much.